Hello everyone, I'm Lawrence from Extra P. Welcome to our Cairo auditing course. The aim of this course is to help develop your auditing skills in Cairo, and we've created for you nine modules. In this module, I'm going to give you a general introduction to security. Module two, we take a look at the Cairo language. And then in module three, we look at the architecture of StarkNet. In module four, we look at the contract structure. And then in module five, we start to really go into detail about the types of vulnerabilities that you may find in Cairo contracts. In module six, we look at some of the tools that may help you when you're auditing. And in module seven, we look at the issue of testing and some of the techniques you may find useful. And then we take a bit of a step back in module eight and we look at the auditing process more generally. And then we finish off in module nine by looking at some example reports and some uh, particular issues that have been found that we uh, have mentioned in earlier modules. Now, this course is uh, and will remain free as are many other resources available on our education website, which is linked there. So how best to use this course? Well, uh, we will be updating the modules frequently, so please do check back. If you're already familiar with Cairo, then you uh, may want to skip modules two and four. And we have a discussion channel available for you on our Discord server. There's an invite link there. And in there, you can ask questions and discuss uh, aspects of security on Cairo. So to give a bit of background, what's the, the motivation for this? Why is security a potentially a problem? Uh, well, it's uh, one reason is the, the value that uh, is available to people who may want to exploit some of these protocols. So there's a, a little table here showing you some of the, uh, the, the total value locked in different protocols. And you can see that there is a great amount uh, there, that uh, the, the potential for hacking uh, can be very large indeed. And so we need to be careful when we are writing applications on these protocols that we don't leave them open to uh, vulnerabilities and open to attack by hackers. So looking at CK generally, uh, there's really two aspects of it. You can think about the, the computational integrity aspect of zero knowledge proofs, and you can also think about the privacy aspect. Now, if we're thinking about StarkNet, we're really concentrating on the first one. The use of zero-knowledge proofs in StarkNet is to show that transactions have been processed correctly. StarkNet itself is a public chain, and so the issue of privacy is not used. Um, some general points about ZK programs. Well, the proofs are, are an interaction between a prover and a verifier. And there are some essential properties that they have. The first one is called completeness. And this means that correct proofs will definitely be accepted by the verifier. The second one, the, really the, uh, the flip side to that is the idea of soundness. And this is that a dishonest prover has a very low probability of cheating an honest verifier. And then in addition to that, we need the, the property of zero knowledgeness. Now, uh, the way that we create zero knowledge proofs is that we generally start with some higher level domain specific language, for example, Cairo. And then that is compiled into what is often referred to as a circuit. Now, uh, there are different types of DSLs. Uh, as Cairo is the one that we're interested in, but there, there are others. Uh, there's uh, ones for MENA, we've got Noir for Aztec, and uh, Rust for Risk Zero. Something that they have in common, though, is the fact that they uh, there are some details about implementation that we need to be aware of. They are based on finite fields, and uh, they use very uh, complex aspects of cryptography. 
the fact that they are based on finite fields means that we are working with integers and those integers have a maximum value. And because of that, it means we, when we're doing arithmetic, we're doing modular arithmetic. Now, if we think in very general terms, what could a potential attacker do uh, if they are attacking one of our applications? Well, it's possible that they could break privacy. Now, on StarkNet, that's not really a problem because we really don't have privacy anyway. But I'll come on. I'll come back to this uh, this aspect of privacy a little bit later. Uh, the, the second point here I've got is that they can create a false proof, and uh, this would be allow them to break business logic. So this is really what we're going to be concentrating on: the fact that in our application, if we have a vulnerability, this could allow an attacker to do something malicious, maybe transfer funds when they shouldn't be able to. But the, the zero knowledge proof that is created that that transaction, including the attack, that transaction was handled correctly, that proof is still a correct proof and it would be accepted by the verifier. Okay. Uh, a further point I want to make is that zero knowledge proof applications uh, are seen perhaps as being more robust. We have perhaps more faith because there is a proof involved. And therefore, we may be prepared to take more risks when we're using them. And the, uh, the second point here is that in traditional applications, we are usually trying to compute some results. In zero-knowledge applications, we are more concerned with showing that a result is correct or that some computation has been done correctly. So let me just go in, into a little bit more detail about some of the vulnerabilities that are found in zero knowledge proofs generally. This, this screenshot here is taken from a paper that looked uh, at what types of vulnerabilities have been found in various zero knowledge uh, protocols. And the, uh, the, the takeaway point from this really is that uh, the majority of them are involved in this circuit, as you can see here. So what this means is that the majority of problems that we see are really involved in the, the application and then how that is turned into a circuit. So that is the area that we're really concentrating on when we're looking at auditing. We're, we're very much concentrating on the application aspect. We tend to assume that the rest of the protocol is working correctly. Now, I'll just mention a couple of potential areas. Again, I'm talking generally about zero knowledge proof applications and protocols here, but a, a couple of areas that tend to reoccur. Uh, the first one is the idea of under constrained circuits. And this is uh, about the fact that when we write a, a zero knowledge application, what we are doing is we are writing some code that will test some claim. And when we create that application, we have to be very careful that we uh, completely test the claim that is being made. So if, for example, we have someone claiming that they know the square root of 25, then we can write some code that will test that claim. And the, the zero knowledge proof that is created is a proof that the, the code that we have written was executed correctly and the test that we uh, had to the test the claim was executed correctly. Now, if in our code we don't introduce sufficient tests, then that proof will still be correct. It will still show that our code was correct and executed correctly. But our code, in, a fa in fact, was incomplete and we were not sufficiently testing the claim that someone was making. Now, the, the second point uh, I have here is all about the implementation of our applications and the fact that they are running on uh, zero knowledge protocols and the fact that they are working on finite fields and the fact that we are using modular arithmetic. And this leaves us open to arithmetic overflows and underflows. And the, the uh, point you can see here is that 
uh, we could have an example where we have some variables, we're adding them together and producing a result. And you may well think that uh, if we say the result is going to be 11, you may well concentrate on the second uh, example here, where x is 5, uh, y is 6, and z is 0. But you should also be aware that there are other ways that we can produce 11. And that's the top example here, where if our uh, z is sufficiently large, then we will get overflow, and then that will bring us back round to make the final result 11, even though our value for z uh, is in fact very large indeed. Okay. A further point here, this, this example, is uh, if you imagine we have a simple accumulator and our application is just adding some details at each step of the application, just adding some values at each step of the application. And we, when we are checking this and, and checking that this is being, uh, this algorithm is correct, we could say, well, the total on any one row is the total on the previous row plus five. That's the way I've designed this, this little example. And you may think that's sufficient. But uh, you also do have to think about other things. So in a zero-knowledge proof application, you would also want to be checking that the starting point is what you expect it is, that the end point is what you expect. Uh, and maybe you would be checking that the values that we are adding are within a certain range. And the, this point about range checks is important, particularly when we think about uh, overflow, I mean, as in the, the previous example. We often want to check that the, the inputs we have to our functions are in a particular range so that we can be sure that we are avoiding overflow. So uh, I want to go on to hear some general points about auditing zero-knowledge systems. And of course, the, the usual Web 3 and Web 2 principles will probably still apply, um, but we would then have on top of that some extra ZK points to check. And some of these may be difficult to check unless you are a cryptographer. There are going to be some very complex aspects of the system that uh, you, you would need uh, expert knowledge to be able to to be able to check. For example, the compiler that is taking your domain specific language and turning that into a circuit uh, to uh, understand if there were any problems with that, you would probably have to have some uh, expert knowledge of cryptography. So in this course, and what we're uh, really focusing on, is, is not looking at that uh, level of uh, expertise, but uh, looking more at the application level and seeing what points we can find at that level. And we can still find things such as under constraint code. Um, and uh, other things uh, we can find are, for example, overflow, as I, I just showed you. Um, also, breaking of privacy, although, again, on StarkNet, this, uh, we don't have privacy, so this is not exactly a problem. And just to finish off, uh, to tell you a little bit about ourselves, uh, we're an uh, auditing and education company. We audit on Solidity, Cairo, uh, and on MENA. We also run other auditing courses as well. There's a link there to uh, a site where we uh, show you the, the course available. So uh, if you want to stay up to date with what we have to offer, please follow us on social media. The website shown there is our education website. So we've got lots of resources available for you there uh, and general Web3 resources to uh, give you uh, skills in, in various areas. And there's also an invite there to our Discord server uh, where you can uh, discuss some of the aspects of this course. So thank you for joining Module 1 uh, and I look forward to speaking to you again on Module 2. Thank you everyone.